the good students sit in the front row. The brown nosers sit in the front row. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, I think we'll get going here, um, even though people may trickle in. I welcome you all this afternoon to Morgan Library. Thank you all for coming. We're very, very excited to have some very, very distinguished guests. We will talk with you. Um, they've asked me not to say too much about them, but I, I have to say a few things. Um, we have David Wiley, who is the co-founder and chief academic officer of Lumen Learning, which is a company that helps People or universities transition into open educational resources and assist them in that process. Um, that's one very, very small part of, of his world. Right now, he is serving as an educational fellow at Creative Commons. He has been a senior fellow for open education at the National Center for Research on Advanced Information for um, Digital Technology. He's been, he has been a tenured professor at BYU and is now still functions as an adjunct professor there, I believe, and um, also has led or and possibly still leads the open education group there. And this is among many, many accolades and credits, so we're very, very fortunate to have him. And Nicole Allen is the director of open education for Spark, which may, many of you, but maybe not all of you know, is an organization, an international organization, which um, tries to lead in the area of open access. And um, she also, she focuses on public policy and engaging the library community. She has for many years in her previous life um, been very involved with student perks, in, especially in the area of open education. And I had to, I had to add this because this is my favorite part, um, was part of a, a participating in and organizing a 40 campus tour called the Textbook Rebellion. So please help me in welcoming our guest. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Try again. <laughs> that was quite an introduction. So hi, everybody. Um, the, I have to tell you, the textbook rebellion, uh, <laughs> one of the features of that campaign were two giant mascot costumes, uh, a good guy textbook and a bad guy textbook, <laughs> and a van that uh, I drove uh, across the country uh, with those two giant mascot costumes in the back. <laughs> Interesting life experience. Um, but uh, I just want to start out by telling you a little bit about my perspective as a former student advocate and, and current, currently working with the library community. Um, so I came to the issue of open education actually as a college student um, uh, at the University of Puget Sound in Washington State. And uh, uh, as a member of the millennial generation, I grew up having access to Google and, and expecting information to be free online and just being used to having access to all of the information I wanted for free. Um, that was also the Napster generation. Uh, so when I got to college and was assigned textbooks that were over $100 a piece, prices have actually doubled since then, um, it just blew my mind that my you know, cutting edge 21st century education required expensive printed books. Uh, and of course I found them valuable, but I found during my education, I spent more time on Wikipedia and Googling subjects to try to get the information that I needed. Um, and while that doesn't replace textbooks, it certainly illustrates how, uh, you know, people today, students today, uh, have more sources of knowledge than they ever have before and an expectation to be able to access it instantly. And when I graduated college, I, I went to work for a student organization that was advocating for affordable education. And I really realized that textbook costs uh, were part of that problem that we could address today. Uh, so obviously student debt, and, and the high cost of tuition, and living expenses, and childcare for, for graduate students. Uh, you know, those are huge problems. They also have huge uh, solutions that are really difficult to, and political to tackle. But textbook costs, it's something that really impacts student success. Even though it's just a small piece of the overall cost of higher education, it has a disproportionate impact on students because it's one of the last expenses 
that they pay after after financial aid covers other expenses, usually paid out of pocket by students, so they really feel the cost. Uh, and in many cases, it causes them to delay buying new books or not buy them at all, which can have a disproportionately large impact on their academic success. Uh, so, uh, given that in today's world we have the ability to share knowledge uh, more efficiently and more quickly than we ever have before, um, that's how I came to the issue of, of open educational resources as a solution for this problem. And for, for seven years, worked with that student organization advocating for solutions from policy to working with faculty on campus. Uh, and then two years ago, I joined uh, Spark, which uh, has a dual focus on uh, working with libraries to support the adoption of free uh, open materials on campus. And then also in policy, we're based in Washington, D.C., and I help lead a coalition of organizations in the U.S. that advocate for policies that advance uh, open education. Um, so that's, that's my story. Hello. Yes, great. Okay. So uh, a little bit about of my story of how I come to to all of this. Um, in the late in, in the late nineties, there was a. Um, how many of you have heard the term free software before? By show of hands. Okay. So in the late nineties, there was some concern that free software was uh, the word free and free software was giving it was causing it more trouble than it needed. And, and also there was a, the champion of free software is a somewhat strident man uh, named Richard Stallman. And that's the nicest way to, to say that about him. And in, uh, in early 98, there was a group that got together and said, we need to, we need kind of a new PR campaign for free software because businesses aren't using it. People aren't benefiting from it. They're being scared off by the word free. And so uh, coming out of this meeting, they announced that they're gonna start a new kind of a new branding campaign for this movement. They're going to call it open source. And um, that was in February. And that really had a big impact on me. That was a world that I was a part of. And and um, anyway, later in, later in 98, I realized that all the interesting work around open licensing and around the power of collaboration and openness was all kind of trapped in the software world. And no one had tried to port that over into other places like textbooks or educational materials or research articles and thought that um, you know, somebody ought to start trying to persuade people that that was a good idea. Um, and so from the, you know, from the very early days, I've been advocating for this idea of open education and um, open content or open educational resources or whatever language you want to use to describe it. Um, but I have spent a lot of my time evolving, refining, trying to clarify ways to talk to people about what open, open educational resources are, what it means. And so um, we're going to bounce back and forth and use a couple of slides here and there in, in the forum today. But I do want to take just a second to lay out some, some kind of groundwork terms and definitions. When we say open educational resources, what do we mean? So that during the rest of the day, every time we say OER or open educational resources or open textbooks or whatever comes out of our mouth, you'll understand what we mean by open. So the, the first thing I want to just clarify quickly is that open does not mean free. But I think there's a broad misunderstanding in the world that open means free. Um, so the point that Nicole was making a minute ago, the, everything online is assumed to be Free. CNN is free, National Geographic is free, SportsIllustrated.com, ESPN.com is free. Like everything online is free the, for, for the normal person's experience of online, not a student who's dealing with library and commissioned resources. Um, so free is kind of almost not interesting. Free is the assumed starting point. When we talk about open, in, in terms of open educational resources, what we really mean are free plus permissions. And um, the, the definition that I would encourage you to think about when you think about open is this two-part definition that first there's free and unfettered access. I don't have to create an account. I don't have to uh, 
pay to get behind a paywall. I don't have to give you my zip code or my email address. I can just I can access the resources. And in addition to that free access, I'm granted uh, in a very in a legal sense, I'm granted a set, a set of copyright permissions that we call the five R permissions. And these are the five R permissions here. So retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. So retain, retain means that as opposed to kind of the Netflix, Spotify universe of streaming access to things where I never, I never get a copy of name a movie, quick fill me out. The Matrix. The Matrix. I never get my own copy of The Matrix, but I can go online and stream it at any time. This is very much a reaction against the kind of um, transition in the world to a place where people never own anything, they can only access temporary copies of things. So you have to be able to make and own your own copy of the textbook or whatever educational materials we care about. And with the copy that you have made, you need permission to use it in a wide range of ways, permission to open it up, modify it, adapt it, improve it for the local context and with the students that you're working on, put examples in it that will speak to them that they all understand. To take two or more and combine them in a remix or a mashup, maybe chapters from here and videos from there and simulations from a third place and bring those together in a new thing. And then whatever it is that you've done, whether it's the copy, that you, the original verbatim copy that you made or the adapted version that you created or the remix that you made, you need permission to take that and be able to share it with others. And all of this, again, without royalty, without payment, just making it available. For free. So by show of hands, how many of you are familiar with Creative Commons? A few of you. So Creative Commons is an organization that provides copyright licenses that instead of spelling out all the things you're not allowed to do and all the ways you will be punished if you do any of those things, spells out, here are all the permissions that we give you. We give you permission to make copies. We give you permission to do all of these things. Um, I'll point out just one more time that retain is the fundamental R of the five R's. You can't revise something when, like you can't revise the CNN website. You don't have a login, you don't have an account, you're not an administrator. You need to be able to make a copy of a thing to be able to make changes to it or to mash it up or to share it with others. It's prerequisite to most of the other R's. Um, the, the, only, the only other point I'd make about this and then I'll stop broadcasting slides at you is that um, I wish I could take credit for this term, I can't, but there's, I made reference to it earlier this morning. There's an idea that you could contrast open with open or faux open. These are resources that are available for free, that probably access is gated in some way, and they're definitely all rights reserved in terms of copyright, and the terms of use of the website might even place additional restrictions uh, on you over and above what traditional copyright would place on you. So when we talk about open for the rest of the forum, this is what we mean. We don't just mean things that are free, but we mean things that also come with very clear legal licenses that formally grant you permission to engage in a bunch of activities like making copies, making changes, giving those copies to your students, and then being able to give them to other people as well. Does that Make sense in terms of kind of basic terminology, what, what what we mean by open. Any questions about that before we go on? Not all at once. Okay. Very good. Um, what's next? So uh, we've spent the morning here on campus talking with a bunch of different groups of people, faculty, librarians. Um, administrators, and uh, there were three main themes in the conversation that um, oh, yes. we thought we'd just uh, spend a few minutes each uh, talking about, um, just to give you kind of a, a landscape of what's going on in the OER space, and then we'll open it up for questions uh, so we can have a discussion on it. Um, as we're talking about this stuff, please feel free to just jump in and, and ask any questions on it. So the three areas uh, that we wanted to talk about um, our first quality. Uh, so um, how, do, how do we know that open educational resources are quality and don't you get what you pay for and can good resources really be free? Uh, those kind of things. Um, the second is in terms of affordability and student outcomes. 
So what's actually the impact in the classroom of using these resources and, and kind of what's the case? Uh, and then finally, we want to show you a few examples of what OER uh, is out there and, and some places that you can go to look for OER um, if, if you're either a faculty member or librarian working on it. Very good. So I, I'm going to do quality. I'm going to start with Grumpy Cat. Because this is my, I love, I love this. There, there's very much a mythology around this idea that you get what you pay for and you only get what you pay for. Because it works that way in the rest of our lives, right? If you buy a more expensive car, you expect it to be a nicer and a better car than a cheaper car. If you buy a more expensive stereo, you expect it to be better than the cheaper one. So there is what we joking, I jokingly refer to as the grumpy cat hypothesis, that the more expensive educational materials are, the more effective they must be. And free and open materials, of course, can't be any good at all. So um, I just want to provide uh, examples from a couple of studies that we've done kind of looking specifically at this question. This says that this study was accepted in JCHE. It's actually out now and it's in open access so you can go and grab a copy of it. Um, and actually all these studies I'm gonna talk about are listed on the website openedgroup.org. So you can go and download uh, the studies from there. That's our research group at BYU. So just to give you a sense, um, this is, yeah, so this study includes about 15,000 students, between 15 and 16,000 students in several differently numbered undergraduate courses across 10 institutions, but it's really kind of 16 core courses. Those courses taught by about 130 teachers, um, about 16,000 students taking those courses. And what we're looking at is we're looking specifically at cases where faculty members have stopped assigning commercial textbooks and replace those commercial textbooks with open educational resources. Um, you know, so in, in this particular study, we're controlling using propensity score matching by age, gender, and race for students. And we're looking at these four um, outcomes, completion rates in the course, see or better final grade, credits enrolled this term and credits enrolled next term. And we're looking at those credits enrolled this term and next term because we had heard anecdotally that students who save money on textbooks will reinvest that savings in signing up to take more classes and in, in paying for additional credits. I'll, I'll skip over what propensity score matching is about because I'm not trying to do a big methodological talk here, but this table you can see there's a couple of columns with some blue boxes and red boxes here. This this first, well, of course, these are the, the, the kind of collapse these into common course numbers. Um, here's the number of students in control and treatment. This is you know, the completion rate, so you know, students who, the percentage of students who finish the course. This is C minus or better at final grade as a binary variable. Did they or did they not receive a C minus or better? And this is course grade as a continuous variable on a scale of zero to four. Um, how did they do? And what you'll see here is you'll see a lot of NSs, a lot of no significant difference in these outcomes. Uh, but you'll see some cases where the treatment group outperformed the control group. And you'll see one case in which the control group outperformed uh, the treatment group on, on grades, so not on completion. The basic message here being that you know, we're replacing textbooks that cost $100, $150 with materials that are free, and students are in. 15 out of 16 kind of large buckets of courses, 15 out of 16 groups of students are doing the same or better in terms of their final course outcomes. David, can I jump in and just Please say do. that Please. in a slightly different way? Um, so uh, all of the courses in this study, uh, the students did as well or better by at least one measure uh, of academic success. And in 93% of the courses, students uh, did as well or better uh, by all of the measures of academic success they looked in this study. Yeah. So um, basically, this helps dispel the myth of you get what you pay for, because in one group of students, they were using expensive textbooks, and the other, they were using free open textbooks. Um, and yet the outcomes are this clear trend towards as good or better. Yeah, and the same thing, you know, the same kind of results in credits taken when you, so they were taking the course using the OER in the fall. You can see students who used OER 
we're taking you know, not quite a credit and a half more. Oh, sorry. In the fall case, it's over two credits. In the in the winter case, it's not quite. It's about a credit and a half more. Students are taking that. What we'd heard anecdotally that students were taking the money they'd saved on textbooks and reinvesting it to take more classes, which should lead them to graduate more quickly if they're taking classes faster. Uh, actually, did bear out. Um, and let me talk about. I'm going to talk about two more studies, too, hopefully pretty quickly. And this is the study with the worst name of all educational studies ever conducted. And so um, would be very happy to get ideas for better names for this framework. But the idea here is this is the this is kind of playing out the grumpy cat hypothesis, right? So what percentage of students are going to complete my course with a C or better as a function of how much money I'm asking them to spend on the required course material? There should be an assumption that and if I don't ask them to spend very much, but none of them do very well, that makes me sad, but that's maybe not to be anticipated. If I ask them to spend a lot of money, but and a lot of them do complete with a C or better, that makes me happy, but maybe that's not to be unanticipated. Right? The Grumpy Cat hypothesis is up and to the right relationship between cost and completion of the C or better. But if I ask them to spend a lot of money and they don't do very well, that makes me angry. If there's some magical way that I could have them not spend very much, but they could still do well, that would be that would be awesome. So, you know, first pulling out some data from a study that we didn't do. This is a, a study that was done uh, by faculty at Mercy College on a transition from a commercial math textbook and math practice platform to an open source math practice platform and math textbook. It, it was published in Educause Review. You know, they report that early on this college algebra course cost about $180 for the bundle, and historically it had a 48% pass rate. That's that's what they've been getting in terms of success for that uh, for that cost. And then over a period of two years, they transitioned all the sections of that course away from commercial materials to open materials, and at the end of that second year, had over a 60% pass rate. Uh, at the end of the third year, I've heard them report in a conference later, at the end of the third year, that pass rate was up over uh, 70%. But what's published in the Educause Review article is a 48, I think, to 64 um, jump in completion. And if we go back and look at these courses, um, if you look at these courses, we went back to the bookstore websites and pulled the costs for all of those textbooks. <laughs> That are represented in that other study. This is how those plot out in terms of cost versus completion with a C or better. So you see here all the courses using OER. Uh, you know that one of the interesting things to note here is that there is a there's a broader spread here of the blue dots along the bottom. You'll see indicating that there's more variability in efficacy here among these open materials. Um, and you'll see here this cloud. Of commercial materials that are costing you know somewhere from around eighty dollars up to two thirty-five or something like that. But you can see I, I don't know if you can see it or not, but if you take the average of all of these, the average of the OER is further to the right than the average of this cloud of dots up here representing commercial materials. And if you if you take out the OER and plot the best fitting line through this cloud of dots at the top, it does not go up and to the right. In fact, it goes down and to the right. Um, you know, I mentioned the Open Ed Group website before. Um, my colleague John Hilton, who is another faculty member at BYU, does kind of heads an ongoing project we have reviewing all the empirical studies on the effects of uh, OER use in place of commercial textbooks. And right now, and this shows you how young the field is, right? There's less than a dozen of these studies that are currently published. They cover about 48,000 students. 93% of them, regardless of which outcome you're looking at, uh, show the same or better outcomes for students. And also when you do survey, when you do qualitative work with faculty and with students and ask them the perceptions around quality, um, with about 4,500 professors and students responding, you know, it's the same kind of thing. About 85% feel like the quality is the same or better, with 15% saying for one reason or another. That they believe that the quality is worse. Yeah. Clarify something for me. Yeah. To what extent does the distinction between the two main control groups also differ in terms of online media versus media? 
So in, uh, in the OER cases, it'll be 100% online. The courses might not be completely online, but the materials are all delivered online. So it might be, you might be meeting face-to-face, -face, but the textbook's available online. Um, but there are some courses in both of those that are run fully online, and some that are kind of blended where they're face-to-face -face with the supporting materials being online. But it's, there, there's no analysis of it broken out by which ones are completely online versus blended. And to clarify, in, in both cases, there's an opportunity for students to either use digital or print um, with open textbooks. Some students will choose to purchase a print copy of the book, which the campus may make available in the bookstore. Well, in this study. In this study, no? Not a single one. Oh, OK. Um, and then in traditional materials, there typically are digital alternatives uh, to the book rather than buying a print copy. So in that case, some of them may yeah. have purchased it. With, and it would have been inconsistent within a class. But are we answering your question? I think so. So in this study, all of the text resources are courses. They, they differed maybe in, in sort of the courses I'm on. But, but are any students in your study using exclusively print text? There, there may have been some students in the treatment, in the control group that were using print resources. But again, for most books that you assign, there's a digital option, there's a print option, and we didn't track at that level what they were using. Any other questions about quality? Yeah. In the algebra mm -hmm. example, was the book the only thing that changed in those couple years? That no. No, so let me let me quickly show this slide. We, we talked about this a little bit this morning, so maybe this is the second time I'll say it. Maybe Pat will have a, have a chance at some of it sticking. Um, so there's, there's kind of three different ways to think about adopting OER. One is just saying, I was using this textbook before, and I'm going to use this bundle of OER instead. Um, or there's an opportunity, instead of just adopting something that someone else has already aggregated, to say, at, at a minimum level, here are the outcomes on my course syllabus, and for every outcome, I'm going to go pick the best smaller resource that fits that outcome and build up a textbook replacement with my outcomes as the table of contents. And then there's an opportunity, a, a, a deeper opportunity, to actually think about revising your pedagogy when you know that all the materials that you're assigning to your students are open. There are things you can ask them to do that you can't ask them to do with commercial materials. And in the Mercy College example, they did make some pretty significant pedagogical shifts as well. Uh, but those shifts were enabled by the fact that they were using OER. So for most of those in, in, that, in that big table where you saw all the NSs for no significant difference, that's where it's essentially just a substitution occurred. Um, but Keep in mind that even in that simple substitution, even if there's not better learning happening, if we're saving them $100 and getting them the same learning outcome, we, we're still doing a favor. We're still doing a favor. Does that answer your yes, question? Yes. Other questions about? Let, let me let me just close then by saying that I think I really struggle to talk about quality. Because I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff that hides inside or hides behind that word. There's a lot of baggage that comes along with that word. So historically, when we've talked about the quality of educational resources, we've we've said quality of educational resources, and then all the things we've looked at have been proxies for quality. So we've looked at who the publisher was, or who the author was or who did the peer reviews, or how beautiful was it in terms of its production values and imagery and things like that. But when you talk about educational resources, there's really only one meaningful measure of quality, and that's efficacy. If students who use the material are learning from it, it doesn't matter who published it or who authored it or what the peer reviews were like. None of those things matter. They're all proxies that might correlate with quality or might indicate quality, but they're not actually quality. And so I, I would much rather we talk about the efficacy of educational materials rather than the quality of educational materials, because it keeps us on task to 
to not get distracted by production values and authorship and peer review and things like that. Because at the end of the day, after efficacy, nothing else matters. Yeah. So as you measure efficacy, you just take the grade in the course? It depends on the, depends on the study. Okay. Um, what, so, else, what are kinds of things you use? Yeah, so um, in the uh, K-12 study that we did recently, we used the, um, the students' scores on the state-administered end-of-year science exam. Yeah. Right, and so in that case, you're looking not just at a standardized test, but you're all you're, it's IRT scaled raw scores that you're looking at that are much cleaner, much more consistent across everybody who's taking them. Um, you know, the Gates Foundation has a real emphasis on see or better, and it's Gates that so Gates funds our research group's work on what's called the National OER Impact Study, and the first study I showed was published as part of that, which is why you see that emphasis on on see or better. And completion. Um, there are other other studies we've done, like looking at drop rate. There's some more slides on that later in the institutional part of this deck that I didn't pull up. But but there there are a number of metrics that you you can look at. And then I'll just add to that um, that the idea of quality is now inextricably linked with access. Um, I, it's impossible to consider the quality of a textbook if students don't have access to it. And what we're seeing is that the cost of textbooks has risen three times the rate of inflation for decades. Um, and the average textbook cost uh, is, is over $200 in many subjects, uh, looking at the, the most popular textbooks. And that means that in, in many courses, students don't have access to the textbook they're using. And that can be the best textbook in the world. But if students can't read it, they can't learn from it. So I think as we're talking about quality, we also efficacy. need efficacy. We also need to <laughs> think about this uh, second theme that we wanted to talk about in terms of affordability. Um, and we, we've seen all sorts of studies that provide really alarming statistics on what's happening uh, today with textbook affordability. There are studies that show you know, two out of every three students say they've skipped buying one or more of their textbooks because the cost is too high. Uh, more than half of students, or more than half of students, according to one study, uh, haven't bought the textbook, uh, the current edi edition of the textbook in a course. So, you know, less <laughs> less than half of the students in your course actually have the textbook that you assigned to them. And there are also studies that look at things like uh, whether students are dropping courses because of the cost of textbooks are dropping out of college altogether. And you know, these, are, these are really scary things. Uh, when we think about uh, uh, the amount we're investing as taxpayers in education, especially at public schools, but also at private schools in terms of uh, student grants and loans. Actually, the US government um, uh, gave out over $100 million in loans last year to students, uh, and over $60 billion in direct aid which includes Pell Grants and work study. So we as taxpayers are investing heavily in this because we believe higher education is important, but if students can't get access to that last piece of their education, which is their materials, uh, they can't make the most of it. So uh, I, I think that you know, when we talk about the quality of materials, we're also talking about access. And I think, and, and I know that the researchers involved in these studies do hypothesize that there's probably some element in, in students who do better with open educational resources, but it's simply the fact that they've had access to the material that they've been assigned starting day one of the course. They're not waiting for their financial aid to come in. They're not waiting to see if the teacher will actually use the book in order to buy it. Uh, they're not waiting in line at the reference desk seeing if the library has a copy of the book. Uh, they're not trying to share with their classmates or trying to photocopy chapters at midnight in the library where people can't see that they're doing that. They're not searching online for a scanned PDF copy. Um, you know, they have access to the material they've been assigned starting day one of the course, and they can keep it forever. And while, while comparison to medical trials, comparing medical trials to educational research is generally speaking an absolutely terrible idea and should never be done, there is one sense in which it's okay to make a comparison like that, and that is you probably all saw in the news recently uh, this 
former hedge fund manager who bought a company that makes a cancer drug that used to sell for $13.50, and he raised the price of it to $750 a pill instead of $13.50 a pill. And regardless of whether a drug exists that cures cancer or not, if you have cancer and you can't afford the drug, you're going to die anyway. It, it's perfectly ineffective for you if you can't afford your medicine. And that's, I think that's, that's the, what Nicole's trying to say here. Education materials can be everything they want, but if I can't afford them, they're perfectly ineffective for me. So that, uh, important to link efficacy and affordability together. Yeah, and I mean, they exist independently. Materials need to be effective. Just because mm -hmm. they're affordable doesn't make them better. Yes. Um, but uh, as we're having these conversations on campus, it's important to consider both elements. And it was interesting to hear you bring up the drug trials, because educational materials are actually similar to pres prescription drugs in another way. Uh, and that's in the way that the economic structure of the market works. So with uh, textbooks, uh, or shall, let's start with drugs. So with, with prescription drugs, uh, they're not like normal products where, you know, when you have a headache and you go to the store, um, your choices are, you know, aspirin, ibuprofen, or acetaminophen, and there are a bunch of different brands, and you get to look at them, look at the price, look at the, you know, the packaging, and decide which one you want. But prescription drugs are different because you're told by your doctor uh, which, which drug you need. Uh, and the doctor is the expert, right, because they've gone to medical school, um, and once the drug has been prescribed to you, you have no choice but to go and buy it because you want to be healthy, uh, regardless of what that drug costs. And that's one of the, the factors in the, the rising cost of prescription drugs. And the textbook market is actually structured in a very similar way, uh, where the consumer is essentially a captive. Uh, because uh, faculty members don't buy the books themselves, just like doctors don't buy uh, the prescription drugs that they prescribe. Uh, and students are required to purchase them no matter what they cost. And well, both, in both of these cases, it's the way it needs to work because the doctor or the professor are the expert. Um, it also creates a dynamic where the publishers or the prescription drug companies uh, can charge exceedingly high prices for uh, their products in, in an artificial way that wouldn't be possible if the consumers were actually choosing their own products. And in the drug market, there's actually some room for improvement because there are such things, um, there are you know, term limits on patents that are you know, reasonable uh, or more reasonable than, than copyright. Um, and uh, uh, generic versions are available. Uh, and in text, the textbook market, there really isn't. The thing that students are doing is buying used copies or renting in order to get access to it. But it creates a really weird dynamic in the market that makes it really hard to change things. And that's why my work with students, students really like the idea of open educational resources, not just because they get free access to the textbook, but because they get choice in a market where they're used to not having any choices. Uh, you know, open educational resources, they're not just online. They can be downloaded and printed and kept uh, students can access it in the format and in the place they want. And in fact, when students are given the choice, they prefer to have both print and digital access and to be able to use it on their smartphone or their tablet or their laptop. And uh, really only in an open environment is that, is that possible. Uh, so I think that that's one of the really compelling illustrations of how open solves a problem uh, that's really impacting students today. So that's you know, that's kind of, those are responses to some of the questions that we heard come up over and over again earlier today, but we wanted to, and I think we've succeeded in reserving a little more than half of the time that's left to just talk with you about whatever you'd like to talk about. So where have institutions been successful in flipping to the OER model? You know, moved to contract with one another. Okay, that's about nine questions. Okay. You remember my sweeping questions. <laughs> I do. do. <laughs> um, you know, I, there's 
encouraging people to think about adopting OER can feel like a technology project, it can feel like a learning sciences project, it can feel like a curriculum redesign project. At, at the end of the day, it's, it's a human change process that you're really managing as you're encouraging people to, to consider doing something different from what they've done in the past. And the, the places where you'll see that working really well are the places where the size of the step that the faculty member needs to take has been made as small as it can be possibly made. Um, there's almost always going, for any anything that you would volunteer to do, there's almost always going to be an inverse correlation between how hard it is to do and how many people are going to choose to do it. So it really becomes a function of how can you make it as easy as possible on your campus for that adoption to happen. So one. Oh, go ahead. So I think one easy place to start is with open textbooks because you know most faculty use textbooks and that's right. kind of where they're comfortable with. Um, and uh, to be clear, there are open resources, you know, nicely packaged as a textbook for every single course. Uh, but there are for many, uh, and especially in, in high enrollment subjects uh, like intro calculus, intro biology, intro chemistry. Uh, where the textbook costs are really, really high, and there are a lot of students who are taking those courses. Uh, so I think that's a really easy place to start, and uh, that's where a lot of the libraries that Spark works with have started. And uh, David, I think, is pulling up a really great resource that's out there called the Open Textbook Library. That uh, Actually, I was going to pull up something else. But. Oh. We pull that up. I will pull that up. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a catalog of open textbooks that have been identified from across the web in a variety of different subjects and uh, vetted for basic you know, quality control. And what the project has done, and they actually visited this campus uh, earlier this month, uh, run workshops with faculty uh, to actually review these textbooks using a rubric uh, and post them online. So you can actually go and see what other faculty members thought of this in terms of the star rating and um, some of the different features. And many of these are in high enrollment courses where there are a lot of students uh, struggling with high textbook costs. And you know, just to give one example, I was at, um, I can't remember where I was, I think it was UT Austin, but that may be wrong. But they had uh, about 200 or 2,500 students per semester taking intro chemistry. Um, so that's 5,000 students a year, and they were using a textbook that costs about $200. Uh, so that's a million dollars a year that students would be spending to buy that book. That's a lot of money on one campus that students are spending, uh, or at least supposed to spend. Uh, and that's the kind of impact that assigning an open textbook can have. And to put things in perspective, uh, textbook publishers will tell you that it costs about a million dollars to produce a textbook, which sounds like a lot. But when the intro chemistry students at one campus would be spending that much <laughs> to buy a book in one year, of course they don't, and not all that money goes to the publisher. But still, that puts things in perspective about how possible it is to produce high quality textbooks um, for, for introductory subjects. So this is the Open Textbook Library. Um, and you can see, you can browse the different subjects, and I think there are close to 200 books listed in here. Uh, and I think the average rating is over four stars. Uh, and one of the things that I find really compelling is that of the faculty who write reviews for uh, this, this uh, library, uh, uh, the last statistic I heard is about a third of them end up adopting the book that they reviewed. 40% is what I heard. 40% is the most but recent. How many of you were here when David Ernst was here a few months ago? I'm sure he talked extensively about the library when he was here. Yeah, there's a question. Yeah. So, so does the um, open access space include ebooks that the library has in its holdings? And if I come across one that happens to be one that I've actually adopted for the bookstore, is that automatically an open resource item, or is it completely different? And what would be my protocol if I wanted to adopt such a textbook? Would I have to inform someone, the publisher? How would that work? So say the first part of your question again about an e-book that was in, a, in the library. So, so what's the distinction between open access materials and if Wharton Library has an e-book in its holdings that mm -hmm. I want to who, who can
can talk. Who, I'm sure somebody in the room can speak to how many copies of ebooks can be checked out at a time and uh, things like that. There are things going on here, which yeah. I'm sure you understand. Um, there's something to be called an open textbook. It generally has to be free, and you can also um, manipulate it. You can change it. You can take parts out. You can add parts. So that's what people refer to when they talk about an open and one example of those would be the open stacks that are supported by the Hewlett Foundation and developed at Rice University. Um, when we buy ebooks, now we may catalog some, some open textbooks. We don't do it right, uh, very many right now, but we may in the future. But I would say the majority of the ebooks that we have are limited, and, and maybe Michelle could add a little bit more to this than I can. But are limited to a certain amount of users, um, but they are not open textbooks, they're owned by a publisher. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, right. so yeah. certain publishers, and that's great. We, we wish more publishers were. Yeah. So the, the answer is potentially yes. Who controls scientific journals? Right. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's, it's us. Right. Elsevier. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, so let's yeah. maybe it would be useful to go over one example of an open textbook and kind of where it came from and what it looks like. Uh, David has just pulled up oh. OpenStax College, which is a project based out of Rice University. Uh, that's kind of a, 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 a startup publisher uh, that uh, grew out of a project there that has been around for many years. Um, around creating a repository of free and open resources that anybody could post up to. Uh, they started focusing on open textbooks, realizing that there was a significant opportunity to have impact on students. So what they're doing is focusing on, I believe, the 20 highest enrollment subjects and producing high quality, uh, you know, very high production value textbooks. Um, their editor in chief is from Cengage Learning. Um, and uh, these books are all 100% free online. David's just gone to their website, and you can see that we're reading the textbook right now, the full text. And uh, you can download copies in PDF and EPUB. You can get specially enhanced copies for a small amount of money through iBooks. Uh, and uh, some of the, you can get print, full print copies, hardbound, full color, beautiful, for $30 to $50, depending on the book. I think black and white is 30, and color is 50 or 55, okay. something like that. We yeah. also produce um, supplemental material as yeah. well. These are really high quality, and we have bought copies of several of them. The other ones. Yeah, so from the student perspective, they can pull this up on their smartphone, uh, read it from home, read it from their laptop. Uh, they can print out whatever pages they want, uh, buy a low-cost hard copy and mark it up. So lots of flexibility. And the great thing about these is because they carry this open license, which is the difference between the Springer books and, and these resources, the instructor has those 5R permissions to be able to adapt and change it if they wish to. Yeah. So there's about 200 in this library now or catalog? And in like from, like in this books. library. Yeah. What, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah, and that's really a kind of discipline by discipline question, you know, how the 
In some cases, there are professional associations that are more interested and invested in open than others are that are encouraging people to, um, to produce more material. In some cases, it's a kind of inspired slash inspiring leader at an institution. So like if you look at UC Irvine, they've just recently done a full set of chemistry videos for every chemistry course they offer on campus that you can use to supplement for example, the OpenStax chemistry book. And that was, somebody got together and was excited about it and pulled some other faculty in and kind of made that happen locally. Um, there, there are private foundations that have emphasis in a certain area as opposed to others in disciplinary areas, maybe like in education or something like that that would fund work. Um, but I don't think you can really answer it cohesively across the whole community. It really becomes a discipline specific kind of, uh, kind of question. Now, I want to swing back around and answer the question that you had asked earlier um, about how can we make it easy for people to adopt, and I was talking about making the steps small. And I, I talked about this this morning, and I said I would show it. Um, this, is a, um, this, this is a Blackboard instance from Northern Virginia Community College. And um, the, the entire, all the, the 23 community colleges in the state of Virginia all run on the same Blackboard instance. It's managed centrally by their uh, central office. And so what's been done here is you see up at the top, there's this OER courses tab. So any faculty member at any community college in the state of Virginia, when they log into their LMS, they'll see this OER courses tab. And they'll see a little bit about what open courses are, um, some information about the LibGuides that the library provides, and then a little catalog key here. And then if I scroll down, you'll see here are a bunch of um, a bunch of OER courses followed by you know LibGuides with the places you can go to find additional information. But for example, here, like we live this College Chemistry One, um, you know, here's a public link where you can go look at. Um, kind of review those materials, see what they look like, um, see what's included in terms of readings and outcomes and imagery and videos and things like that. Um, so you can come out here and you can kind of poke around and see what's included in this material, but you'll see back here too that there is also a Blackboard preview. So I can see what all that it's kind of easier to review the content outside of the LMS, but I can see what it looks like already built in the LMS by coming here and looking at the looking at course materials. And if you remember how beautiful things are in Blackboard, right? Here they are in all of their folders. But eventually you get down and you see it's the same material that you're looking at before, just projected into um, Blackboard over LTI. Um, and if you decide that you want to adopt that, um, you know, once you've reviewed it either outside of Blackboard or inside of Blackboard, um, you know, here's, here's step one, step two. Here's how you adopt this material in your own course. So it, it's about a five minute process post review for you to pull it into your LMS shell and start teaching off of it instead of using your, uh, the textbook that you might have been using before. And I, I don't know how to make it any simpler. Like, here it is, here's what it looks like in your LMS, here's two steps to get it in your LMS, start teaching with it. I'm, I'm sure there are ways to make it simpler and hopefully we'll find them, uh, but you know, that's about as easy as you can make it. So what do you think the barriers to adoption are? Uh, awareness. I think the, um, the, we were talking about this earlier this morning too, the Babson Survey Research Group last year did a broad survey of faculty in the U.S. and asked questions about OER and almost two-thirds of faculty said they hadn't heard of it, didn't know what it was, were unfamiliar with it. Um, but later on in the survey when they explained what it was and asked them for their reaction to that, they also were, and they go on at some length about it in, their, in the report that they wrote, how surprised they were that um, there aren't a lot of strong negative reactions to the idea of OER from faculty. They, they don't know about it. Once they hear about it, understand what it is, maybe see some efficacy research on it. They might not choose to use it, but it's not, it's not because they feel like it's evil in some way or they have some strong negative reaction. They're pretty 
kind of open and, and willing to, to think about and listen to it. And you know, that was a couple of thousand faculty survey rep done in a representative fashion across faculty in the US. So I think the number one issue really is getting the word out that these things exist. Because they kind of sound too good to be true. They're free, they're effective, they're flexible for you. So until you can actually see one, touch one, see what it looks like in your learning management system, maybe meet a faculty colleague who's used one, um, it would just never occur to you sitting at your desk as you're looking at review copies that publishers send you to say, I wonder if I went and searched online if I could find the same thing for free, legally, out there that I'm seeing on my desk. You know what I mean? You just never have that thought. So somebody's got to bring it to you. And that is the first step, but I think once you get beyond that step, there are more barriers. Um, uh, you know, obviously, if you have something like this set up on your campus, um, it's a lot easier. But for campuses that don't, um, I think that kind of th th there are two main things. So one is where do I find the resources to use, and how do I know if they're high quality? And those are two barriers that you know we continue to work to address. And I think libraries are playing a really really critical role. Uh, in, in helping to solve that is an on-campus uh, support system, and then, and then projects like Lumen uh, are doing a great job providing outside support to campuses that want to move in that direction. So we showed you one resource, the Open Textbook Library, is a place where you can both go and find resources and see some information about whether they're good or not um, from other sources. Uh, that's one place. There are many others, uh, and uh, many, many. many, many others. Uh, so I think that just thinking about the role of uh, working with librarians to help navigate that space is really important, uh, and also recognizing that there are barriers. Uh, but that is a, you know just a big opportunity. Yeah, they're not insurmountable. Yeah. At all. Talk about accessibility. Well, when your primary concern is not DRM that keeps people from being able to do a wide range of things, right. and you're just trying to make it available just as plain old HTML5 you know, kinds of material, the accessibility just out of the box is really pretty good. Um, you know, you get into issues about uh, you know, for crowdsourced vid for video that's available, how are you going to get that captioned? Or you know, there are some questions like that. But again, not insurmountable. It's just things you have to think about and plan for how you're going to do. Um, but you know, one of the reasons that the publishers tend to be really bad on that is because so much of their technological focus isn't about enabling access. It's about locking things down. Um, as soon as you're in a mode where there's literally no DRM anywhere, and it's just about providing as much access as you can, then a lot of those things begin to kind of work themselves out more naturally, or at least be easier for you to solve if you do find something that you need to yeah. take on with captioning images or something yeah. like that. A couple of years ago, ARL approached McGraw-Hill and said, why aren't your materials accessible? And they said, the doesn't apply to us. Yeah, I mean, so with that kind of attitude, yeah. Well, and some of the interventions that campuses take to provide, <laughs> um, you know, for example, audio copies of books, it just it just blows my mind. You know, there's some campuses where the only permission they, they can get is to take a textbook and have a student employee sit down and read yeah. that textbook into a tape recorder, and they need to destroy that at the end of the semester and the next semester do it all over again. Crazy. Is that me? Um, and that's on one campus. Think of the thousands of campuses that have students who need interventions for, for print disabilities. And the thing about OER is that once you make that recording, you have the legal right to share it with every other campus and everywhere else in the world. So it, it as David says, they're not insurmountable. In fact, <laughs> it's a whole lot easier. Question? Yeah, I, I'm going to go back to the Blackboard example that you showed. Is there something similar to that on Canvas that if I were interested in a, in a particular book, I could go and look at a Canvas? Okay, so not, not today, but 
it's all done in a standards-based way using LTI. It would be very straightforward to implement if you decided you wanted to do something like that. If I wanted to do something like that, I should talk to the librarian. Uh, talk to me or any of the campus coordinators or mm -hmm. your colleges or we take LTI requests in. We've already got, I think, 18 different LTI integrations, mm -hmm. some for specific courses. We just look at them and make sure they're not going to hurt anything and we've got the rights. And then typically, I think there's only one that would never have turned on that we had requests for. So yeah, hmm. we, we have a, a process for that. But you know, that's not a product of Blackboard. That's the community college system. I understand that. I, just I was sure. just wondering, yeah. what, what can I get at? Is there another question back there? Yeah, I was just going to ask from a uh, slightly bigger picture. What you mentioned that you were not following, what policy changes do you think are going to Awesome question. So uh, let's start at the national level uh, and work down to campus. Um, so I think at the at the national level, uh, a lot of the work that Spark has focused on over the last 10 years has been in the open access space uh, in terms of research. And the government funds billions of dollars of research every year, and yet a lot of the articles that arise from that research aren't available to the public that pay for it. Uh, so a, a lot of our work has, has focused on adopting policies that make sure that when taxpayers fund research that we get the results of that research. Uh, and in 2013, the White House issued a directive to federal agencies to come up with plans to make articles available for free within 12 months of publication. The NIH has been doing that since 2008. Uh, and we've had legislation introduced in Congress that would make that law as opposed to just agency policy. Uh, and uh, we're working toward a similar end uh, in the uh, open education space. So earlier this year, uh, a coalition of over 100 organizations submitted a letter to President Obama, um, which the uh, Colorado State Library signed on to. Very exciting. Um, and it called on him to adopt a government-wide policy that ensures that when the government funds grant programs that produce educational materials, that those are openly licensed to the public. Uh, there's already one example of a grant program that's done that, and that's a $2 billion investment from the Department of Labor that has possibly one of the worst acronyms that has ever been invented. <laughs> it's T-A-A-C-C-C-T. -C 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 -T. Uh, yeah. Really, <laughs> it stands for Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Grants Program. Ooh, up top. Yeah. Yeah. Um, say that 10 times fast. But yeah. anyway, it was a $2 billion investment in improving workforce training programs at community colleges. And rather than funded, funding a bunch of community colleges to fund, create better workforce training programs on their own campus only, it required that they share back any content and intellectual property developed with every other community college in the country uh, so that they can use it and, and adapt and build upon it. So it makes sense because we're investing our taxpayer dollars wisely, not reinventing the wheel. And one of my favorite stories is one of the programs developed, I believe it was an energy curriculum, that uh, a program in another part of the government, the State Department, USAID, uh, is running an energy program in Mexico. Uh, and rather than rebuilding a, a curriculum on energy, they've translated the curriculum developed by one of the community colleges into Spanish and adapted it to the local context. So they're saving our money uh, and uh, contributing more resources to the commons. Uh, so I think we want to, there's, there's no reason why that should not be the, the law of the land in the United States. And we're working toward getting President Obama to issue an executive order. We're likely to see actually a big announcement coming from the White House next week on this. Uh, we don't expect it to be a complete victory, but I think we'll see some exciting uh, developments on this front. Uh, so that's one side of it, is just making sure that when we're funding educational resources that they are openly licensed with, with federal dollars. And that applies at the state level too. Uh, the other side of it is working to provide incentives uh, for campuses to move in this direction because there's a really compelling uh, reason to do that from a, a federal policy perspective because of the amount of money we're spending uh, on higher education and the potential uh, negative impacts that textbook costs are having. 
Uh, so a bill was introduced in Congress uh, actually just the week before last uh, that would create a federally funded competitive grant program uh, to incentivize pilot programs on campuses to support the creation and use of open textbooks. Uh, and that legislation isn't going to move on its own. It's likely to get wrapped up in the Higher Education Act reauthorization project uh, process, which could take between one and 10 years. <laughs> um, but the good thing about it is that it provides really strong language uh, that states can copy uh, and, and pursue at the state level. And it doesn't take a lot of money to have a large impact, as I was saying before, to, to actually have for example, Pearson develop a textbook, it's a million dollars. And the amount of money that that can save students is many, many, many times that. Um, so, uh, you know, looking at more efficient pro processes for developing textbooks, a, a little bit can go a long way. And this year, two states, uh, Connecticut and Oregon, passed policies that invested money in programs to support the adoption and creation of open educational resources. Uh, so those are some of the trends going on in, in government policy, and then as for institutional policy, there's some movement as well. I mean, the, the institutional policy side of it, it depends on if you're talking about sharing OER or about using OER. On, on the using side, there, there's, there, there are no policy barriers for you already. You can already choose whatever textbook you want to choose to use, with some very narrow exceptions. I know like at BYU, if you've authored your own textbook, you can't assign it to your students unless there are more people outside of BYU using it than there will be inside to keep you from putting together you know, some piece of junk and charging $180 for it and pocketing all on your, on your students' backs. Outside of those kind of conflict of interest things, you can already adopt whatever you want to adopt. Um, but as far as sharing open educational resources goes, and I actually didn't look. I don't know what the IP policy is at CSU, what it says around faculty materials, that you would create during the process of your day-to-day -day job sitting in your office using your computer? Do you own them? Does the university own them? Are they jointly owned? Do you even have permission to openly license them if you want to? Um, you, so that would be something to look at on the your contribution back end of things. But as far as policies that need to be passed at any level for you to be able to use an open, uh, uh, open educational resources, there's nothing that needs to happen. You can use them right now. They're being used all over the country right now. The, you, you get into creating efficiencies around making sure that once it's developed, everybody gets access to it instead of all of us having to recreate it. Or do you have permission to share things that you created as part of your day job on your university computer? There, there are policy things there. Yeah, so um, I said earlier that Lumen is an organization that helps um, helps colleges make this transition from commercial textbooks to, um, to OER. And the, the question is specifically, what do we do? Um, so Lumen actually does not engage with individual faculty. If, if you're teaching a class somewhere and you want to use an open textbook, that's awesome and we'll send you content and you can use it. But Lumen doesn't engage at that level. Lumen engages at, at the program level or the department level or the university level and we, you know, tries to do a number of things. Work with academic leadership to understand what are the student success programs already happening on campus and where does OER fit into that. What, what problem are you actually trying to solve by wanting to use OER and making sure that that is going to happen in a way that kind of coheres with local strategy? Um, bringing faculty together for a couple of day training a workshop around kind of you know basic foundational what is OER, what does it mean, what am I allowed to do? Walking them through the process of taking their syllabus, looking at each learning outcome, helping them find good OER for that. So. Instead of teaching you how to use Google Advanced Search, which you can actually use to find OER, it turns out. But if I know that you're teaching Intro to Psych and you send me your syllabus before I come, I can go pull together the list of nine resources for you to look at that are going to cover almost everything you need instead of it being a billion that you're going to find when you search on Google. So it's pr providing some of that support and then some instructional design support on the back side of that. Once you've chosen resources, how are you going to use them? How are you going to use them effectively? 
what might you rethink in terms of your assessment strategy or the, the open pedagogy I was talking about earlier, and then help you get that into a platform where, like we saw in that Virginia case, where it's kind of one button to push to put it into your uh, Canvas. And then over the semester, as you have questions about, are there new OER? I, it turns out I hate this OER I chose. Is there another one I can use? You know, we have a group of people who are former faculty from the disciplines that you can call and say, hey, I'm also an English teacher. I'm looking for you know, better ideas for how to assess or a different OER to use in, in place of the one I chose originally, or like, can you help me think through that? So like technical support that you would call, but more like pedagogical support around OER. And then some analytic services um, on the back side of that to kind of reflect back to you what seemed to be working well, what wasn't, what might you consider improving next time around. And that, so that's kind of packaged together for, and then $5, uh, however many students are being supported in those courses, it's $5 per student and that's what we provide. And then the resources, of course, are still open themselves. Everything is open. It's the service that's $5 yep. by the campaign. Resources are open. The software that we run it on is open. Uh, there will be a clause in our contract with the institution that any new joint work that we would do would be open so that other institutions can benefit from that as well. And then it's, it's not required, but something that we frequently do is uh, joint efficacy research where the first author on a peer-reviewed pub would be the faculty member or the faculty team from here that has the disciplinary expertise. We'd provide methodological expertise and some you know, data analysis and things like that um, to try to help continue to build this evidence base around you know, what works and what doesn't work. And then maybe Pat, back to your original question about what's working. Yeah. Uh, there's one e example from Lumen, uh, the Tidewater Community College Z degree, mm -hmm. uh, that I think would be really great to discuss. Oh, we haven't talked about that yet, have we? Yeah, so one of the things that I, I'm most excited about is schools that are making the jump, not not a random faculty member here, and they're adopting OER, but and it, somebody getting together, like at, at Tidewater Community College, it was really Linda Williams in the business program who went to other faculty in the business program and said, hey, well, she was encouraged by her provost, but he knew that she would be excited by the idea. Um, you know, I think we can do the entire business program on OER and never ask our students to buy another textbook ever. And you know, it was really faculty-led. She was excited about it. She kind of recruited faculty to participate. That then became an outreach to faculty that teach general education courses that students take before they came into that. And the result now is in its but at the end of its third year, a degree program where students are never even asked to buy. So that's a four year. A, a Texas, that's a that's a two year that's a two year program. Um, but now there you know the, there's that program there. There's a similar program which is a an associates of general studies at Nova. Um, there are 16 other community colleges in Virginia that are currently actively working on a degree like that. There's a handful of community colleges in Washington that have already rolled out. A completely OER based degree. Um, every example of that to date is a two year degree, not a four year degree. Okay. But but the analogous thing there is if you look at see so look at what Nova has done with their general studies degree, that's a degree where you go, you basically do your gen eds at the community college and then you transfer in as a junior and finish at a four year yeah. in, in the state. And it, it's today absolutely possible for a four year school to make a commitment to say gen ed here is textbook free. It might not be a single degree program, but it would actually touch every degree program on campus. I like that. Right? And, yeah. and the thing that's still kind of fun about that idea is there's no four year that's done it. Somebody still is going to get to be the first one to do that. So, you know, okay. oppor opportunity <laughs> there. Yeah. Oh, darn. He gets some homework for coming. <laughs> yeah. So there are no royalties whatsoever. And, and end of story. So they're compensated. So you're compensated. It's, it's actually exactly the same way it works when you write a commercial textbook, which is that there's a little advance that you write against, and you never earn enough royalty that you ever even make back your advance, let alone get paid anything else, the way a typical textbook author experiences that. So you might receive a grant 
from NSF or from the Department of Ed or from Hewlett or Gates, or you might there might be a group on campus that pulls together and says, we need an open textbook in this area, and so we're going to fund it internally out of our course redevelopment fund or something like that. Um, and all of those are real examples. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and these are all real examples. And then there are other people who, there's this economist at Berkeley who writes open textbooks just because he hates publishers. Because the publisher he published with before done him wrong, and he said, oh yeah, well, you know, watch this, and had started <laughs> writing a series of other, you know, he had a, there was a while where he had a non-compete where he couldn't write exactly the same textbook again, but wrote other textbooks and pushed them out under open licenses because he could, and because he wanted to stick it to the man, and and he's doing, you know, so that people write them for all kinds of reasons. They're required to under their grant, or they're angry at their publisher, or they're a young faculty member still trying to build a reputation and a name for themselves, and getting OER out there that are used broadly at a wide range of schools is a good way to um, you know, get your name out and develop your reputation as an academic. There, there's a whole range of reasons people do it. Um, in none of them are they ever directly compensated in terms of a royalty after the fact, but it, it's not uncommon for faculty who uh, do good OER work within a discipline to then be asked to come give keynotes or be invited to write papers, to do an, an invited paper in a special issue of a journal or to come consult on an OER project that's being done by another disciplinary, the same disciplinary group at another university. So that might turn into, you know, a little consulting money here or there. There's some kind of secondary financial benefit potentially, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't work on OER with the hopes of becoming wealthy on potential secondary benefits. Right. And if your goal is to get wealthy on writing textbooks, think again. <laughs> yeah. There are a few people who have, um, uh, and I believe actually Cengage Learning still owes one of them a whole heck of a lot of money after they declared bankruptcy. Uh, a couple yeah. years ago. <laughs> I mean, um, if you're Campbell in biology or you're Stewart in calculus or, if you, yeah, I mean, if, if you win the lottery, you can make a lot of money on a textbook, but the odds are about the same as winning the lottery. So, David, if I can suggest one other example. So, we've talked a lot Please. about the kind of economic and quality benefits and affordability benefits of OER, but we haven't talked as much about kind of the remix, revise uh, uh, benefits of OER and, and tailoring it for the classroom. So, David, you have an awesome example of the kind of pedagogy that's possible oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, in the open space that just is not possible yeah. in, in the closed space. Because So, can you talk about PM4? Oh. Yeah. I was going to talk about a different one. Oh, well, okay. they're all good. Let, let, me, let me show two quick examples. I actually think I have slides of them here somewhere, so I don't have to go pull them up. Um, you know, I, I said earlier there are things you can do with open resources that you can't do with other resources, so just let me put some meat on those bones for a second. Um, or maybe, okay, here we go. <laughs> And I think uh, we should change this to Trump versus Christie. I, I love this example. So I, I have a homework assignment that I, I like to give that um, I call my kung fu, uh, my kung fu homework assignment. And well, actually, you know, let me set just let me set two more slides of context for this before I talk about why I think it's interesting. So I, um, you know, I was a either tenure track or tenured for 15 years, and I graded my share of homework during that period of time. And I, I came to feel like there's this implicit, there's this, not bargain, there's an understanding between me and my students. I'm going to assign them to do homework. They're going to do homework and give it to me. I'm going to grade it and give it back to them, and they're going to throw it away. And the idea that all of their work is destined for the garbage can just kind of annoyed me, annoys me still. Students don't particularly enjoy doing that kind of thing. Like I'm thinking here particularly like two-page response paper to ensure that you read the chapter before you come to class or something like that. So is there a way to flip that over into something that at the end, at the end of the day doesn't go in the bin, but actually becomes a useful artifact that other people might find value in and that might make the world a better place. 
So the Kung Fu assignment, <clears throat> I call it the Kung Fu assignment because if, if you remember early Kung Fu videos in English translation, the English never actually matches the mouth movement of the person who's speaking. Do you know what I'm, what I'm talking about? You know, their mouth would move and then, they, then the words would come out later. So this is an assignment that where I ask students to go find some, some old public domain video or some openly licensed video. And it, it's typically public domain video that they end up finding. But take that video and dub new audio over top of it to create something that they would do instead of, for example, writing an essay. So this is an example from a, a, a social media and learning class where typically there'd be some kind of assignment around describe the difference between blogs and wikis, how they both can contribute to learning, how they might be used, something like that. It might be a, might be a two page essay or five page essay. So this group of students, um, and I have them do it in groups, this group went and found this old debate video between Nixon and Kennedy. And um, it's really terrific because they do these bad impersonations of Nixon's voice and this bad Kennedy uh, voice, but they get them, the debate is all about blogs and wikis. And so Nixon is very pro-blog. He's arguing the blog perspective because on a blog, you can con on your blog, you can control what appears there. You publish the content. You control the narrative. You can delete comments that you think are offensive. And then he shows the example of his Watergate blog that he's just published, um, <laughs> where he's, he's controlling what's seen and what's, uh, you know, what, what's being understood. And, and he goes on at some some length about internet predators and if they're leaving inappropriate comments on your blog, you can delete them, you control that. And wikis, anybody can hit the edit tab. There could be kitty porn, there could be, you know, wikis are this terrible wasteland and it should really be about control. And then Kennedy stands up and says, no, you, your opinion of the American public is too low. People want to contribute. They want to, you know, they want to exercise their freedom of speech. They want to... They want to do all these things. And, uh, and if you think for a minute about, at some point in your past, you've been to a conference where at the end of the conference, people said, we want this experience to last. We want it to go on beyond these three days we're together. So we've set up this wiki that we can all contribute to. And, and what happens? <laughs> nobody ever contributes anything to the wiki and it's kind of a graveyard and, and it never turns into anything. So Kennedy, at the end of his closing statement, kind of reflecting on this idea that um, that wikis actually take effort and take some contributing to, Kennedy closes by saying, ask not what your wiki can do for you, but what you can do for your wiki, um, which really in a lot of ways perfectly summarizes what's different about, you know, what's unique about wikis and how they function. And so in, instead of these three students each writing a five-page essay, essay comparing blogs and wikis, they made this video, which then they posted on YouTube. And you can see that this particular homework assignment has been, do, been viewed 52,000 times. If you Google blogs and wikis, you're likely to find this on, in the first 10 <coughs> results um, of what you see on Google. So you know, they put much more effort into this than they would have ever put into the essay that they wrote. And I put much more effort into my editing and suggesting and grading and um, it turned out to be something that didn't go in the garbage can but made the world a better place when it was over and there are lots of people who have learned about the difference between blogs and wikis by watching this video. Uh, the example that Nicole was talking about, this is an example from a different course that I used to teach when I was still full-time faculty about project management specifically uh, for instructional designers. And there is no textbook, of course, called Project Management for Instructional Designers. I think this course is offered at 40 institutions total across the US, probably. But we took, we, we took an open project management book that was directed kind of business school audience. And then um, over a series of semesters, instead of, because I'm super lazy, instead of me going through and reworking the textbook to turn it into not project management for business school, but project management for instructional designers. Each semester, I broke the students into groups and I had them rewrite portions of the textbook as their primary assignments that they did for class. And instead of grading essays and whatever else, I was editing their contributions to the book over the course of the term. And if you think about 
the relative understanding a student has to have to pass a, a 20 item quiz at the end of a chapter versus being able, for example, to pull out all of the little case studies in yellow boxes in a chapter and replace them with new ones that accurately illustrate the principles being described in the chapter, um, it actually requires significantly more better understanding to be able to write meaningful case studies that can go into the textbook than it does to be able to do a quiz at the end of chapter. We've had you know, a number of students over the years work on this book in different ways, slowly changing it from being a generic project management textbook into being a book that is really about project management for instructional designers. And this is the kind of thing that you can only do with an open resource. You could never do this with a commercial textbook because you don't have permission, you don't have the source files, you don't have, you can't do anything. You certainly couldn't share it. And the students who go through this class who make really significant contributions to the book, if you scroll down to the bottom of this page, you'll see they're listed as co-authors on the book now. So these students now come out of this course as co-authors on a textbook that's used in a number of programs around the country. Um, but again, it's just, uh, you know, the the Kung Fu video, you can only do that assignment because those videos are either in the public domain, so there are no copyright restrictions on them, which gives you the 5R permissions, or they're openly licensed, which gives you those same permissions. That, that, that kind of assignment, or this kind of rewrite the book, turn the book into the book we need it to be kind of assignments, can only be done when you're assigning OER as the materials for the course. And the last thing I'll say about this, I, I, at the end of this course, I always ask students, um, well, after I did it the first time and I saw how engaged students got, I started telling all the students in this class on the first day of class, congratulations, you all just received an A in my class. Isn't that wonderful that you have this terrific grade? And now for the rest of the term, um, you're really playing for reputation and for pride among the other people in the class because every week you're going to stand up and give a report on what you're doing and how you're making the book better. And you're not going to want to be you know, outshined by your peers. And so at the end of this course, each semester I'd ask students, was your grade ever in doubt in this course? And they'll say, no, you told us on the first day of class we were all getting A's. And then I'll ask them, was there any course you took this semester that you spent more time and effort on than this class? And then they kind of have this panic attack moment where they realize that somehow they've been snookered. <laughs> that they knew they had an A, and yet you, to the, I've never had a person answer this question the other way. They always spend more time and effort on this class than they do on any other course that they're in. And it has to do with the fact that they know that what they're doing is actually a valuable contribution that someone else will see later on that might be used other places. Um, there's the public aspect of it where they're all showing their projects during the term and they don't want to be outdone by each other. Um, and me, as the faculty member, grading work, it's not grading stuff I know someone's going to throw away. It's, it's way more interesting and engaging for me editing something that's going to go into a book that I'm going to assign again next year to other students who are going to come along and take it. So it's, it's win, win, win for the students, win for me. Um, and it's all enabled by the fact that the material is open. And I see we're almost out of time, so I'll just add one small final thought to that. Uh, you know, the, the things that David just described, this is what the internet was meant for. Uh, these are all of the things that we're used to doing in the digital environment uh, and really illustrates the potential that's there to transform teaching and learning. And not every professor wants to teach like this in their own yeah, class. Um, but I, I think as we're thinking about the future of course materials and what kind of infrastructure is being laid on campus, uh, this, is, this is the bar. This is where things can go. Uh, and I think we need to think about how to ensure that the future of course materials enables this full potential rather than crippling it uh, with artificial restrictions on access DRM. And, and intellectual property and, and really think about how we can leverage the full power uh, of the internet and technology to improve teaching and learning. Final thoughts or questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.